tonight we welcome back um, Jeff Kleeps. Uh, Jeff Kleeps is the traveling librarian. Um, and tonight he's going to bring another one of his popular armchair travel presentations. This series highlights travel photography and stories and travel tips about destinations around the world. This month we'll be staying in the US, just three hours by plane down the East Coast, visiting Savannah, Georgia. With its incredibly well-preserved architectural heritage, charming squares, delicious food, hopping nightlife, and day trips to the surrounding islands and beaches, this popular city has something for everyone. Um, a little bit about the speaker. Jeff is the recently re retired head of reference services at the Lucius B. Memorial Library in Wakefield, Massachusetts, and an avid traveler and photographer. And I just wanna note that he does provide all of his own photography during his presentations, which is excellent. Um, and they're very well researched. So I hope you enjoy it. Please submit your questions to the chat to be asked after the presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming back. Those of you who've um, uh, been to these programs before and welcome to anyone who's new. Um, as Jess said, um, I am the traveling librarian and I enjoy um, both armchair travel and real travel. I combine my, my hobbies of amateur photography and travel into these programs, and I'm so glad that people have enjoyed them, particularly during the pandemic when a lot of us have been unable to travel the way we would normally like. It's uh, fortunately things seem to be opening up now, and I hope that um, later this year, uh, those of you who have been itching to get somewhere will get a chance to do that. Um, and I would highly recommend Savannah because it's very close by. Um, there are some nice, easy, inexpensive flights there, um, and it's a wonderful way to get away to a very different kind of place, get some nicer weather um, without going too far. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Um, as Jeff said, if you have any questions during the program, um, because we have such a large group, um, please put them in the chat. If I see them going by, I'll try to answer them as we go through the program. Um, and if uh, and anything else we'll catch at the end, I'll stay as long as necessary to answer anyone's questions. So um, I hope you can see my screen now. And we will get started. So to put um, Savannah on the map first, I'm going to show you a map. Um, you can see Savannah. Oh, oops. Actually, my laser, little laser pointer. Savannah is down here right on the border with South Carolina, which you can see along here. Um, it is very close to Charleston, South Carolina, and often people visit the two cities uh, together because they have somewhat similar styles and feel to them, and they're only a couple hours apart, two, two and a half hours by car at most. George, um, uh, Savannah, however, is Georgia's fifth largest city. It's only about 150,000 people, which makes it about the same size as maybe, say, Springfield, Mass. It's not even as big as Worcester, um, but it is one of the most visited and historic cities in all of the United States. It continually tops the lists of uh, favorite uh, cities to visit in the United States for travelers. Um, its population, uh, it, it's often, like I said, it's often compared to Charleston. Um, Charleston actually has a, a larger black population. Charleston's about three quarters black, whereas Savannah's only about one half. Um, but having been to both of them in the past couple of years, it was very interesting for me to kind of compare the two. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. Um, the other thing that you should know about the area is, in addition to the cities, of course, there's a lot of beautiful low country uh, coastline to visit as well, and Hilton Head is probably uh, the most popular place to visit uh, right here just north of Savannah and the very uh, southern tip of South Carolina. There's a lot of golfing, um, but um, there's also fantastic beaches um, and a really great food scene if you're into um, good restaurants. Uh, zooming a little bit most, uh, a little bit closer, you can see that um, it's uh, as as is Charleston. It's um, right on a river, um, a lo typical Low Country port, um, and still even today a very important shipping port. Even though it's about 15 miles um, between Savannah and the open ocean out here, um, you can see how surrounded it is, not just by suburban development, which there isn't actually all that much of but by a lot of uh, wetlands. 
and, and open marshland area. It was founded in the 1730s by someone named General James Oglethorpe. And initially, Savannah was the capital of the Georgia colony. Um, it was named for the river, the, the Savannah River, rather than the other way around. Um, and the city layout is interesting because it was one of um, the United States' first um, deliberately planned cities. You can see it is very uh, grid oriented towards the river, um, but even more so, it has 22 squares, which I have very badly highlighted um, in this little map here, just so you can kind of see how they're arranged. Um, they serve as focal points um, for the city every few blocks with um, trees and landscaping and surrounded by beautiful homes. We'll see a lot of that. And today they, um, in addition to just being beautiful parts of the city, they almost serve as traffic calming um, because you really can't go speeding down the streets very far before you come to one of these squares and you have to go around it. Um, the Georgia colony was, uh, was interesting in the beginning. Savannah was um, originally founded as um, a place where slavery was not legal. Um, it was then legalized basically by economic demands um, by a royal decree in 1751, and then it was banned again in 1798 and went back and forth um, several times. Um, and of course, the illegal slave trade continued even during time periods when officially it was not a slave, um, a slave city. Uh, here you can even get <laughs> Uh, a better idea of how the city is organized because they have very conveniently placed these sidewalk plaques. Um, I guess they're brass or bronze, indicating your location. So if you're kind of if you've had too much to drink and you're wandering around the downtown um, late at night, you can uh, just look down at your feet and you'll get a rough idea of where you are. Speaking of alcohol, if you travel there, um, Savannah is known for its permissive alcohol laws. Um, one of which is that you are allowed to drink publicly as long as you have your alcohol in one of those 16 ounce plastic solo cups. Um, and as long as you stay in the historic district, it's perfectly fine to drink out, out, out on the street. Um, and this is just speaking of sidewalks, I thought I would throw this in just because it was kind of interesting. I noticed that um, many of the modern sidewalks throughout the city are made up of this interesting pavement that includes a lot of shells mixed in with the asphalt, um, which, uh, I think would actually be a great idea in the north because it would be, give you much better traction in the winter. Obviously, that's not a problem in Savannah. I was there just uh, very recently, uh, beginning of December, just a couple months ago, um, and I stayed in this delightful Airbnb um, right here, this, this kind of pink colored house. Um, it's way down at the end, uh, the southeast end of Forsyth Park, which is the biggest sort of central park in the city um, on a little alleyway. And here's the completely over the top, fabulous, comfy interior, um, which was a great place to stay. Um, bear in mind, this was, uh, again, the beginning of December when Omicron uh, was kind of running rampant throughout the country. So it was kind of good for me to be able to stay all by myself um, and eat takeout in my relatively um, socially distanced uh, Airbnb, but it was a delightful place to stay and very close to a lot of the things um, that you would want to see as a tourist. Um, here's uh, the alley that it's on. It's uh, Savannah is kind of interesting because the entire city, not just the historic district, but uh, pretty much the entire city, um, has little back alleys that parallel the main streets in between them. And they are very often unpaved, as you can see this one is. Um, and the advantage to it, uh, here's another one uh, more in the historic district. Um, they serve as service access points for parking and garages and trash bins um, and so forth. And, and what that means is that the actual public streets um, are much more attractive because you don't see as many of people's cars parked in front of their houses. You don't see their recycling bins um, and so forth. Um, so it's, uh, again, this was part of the planning that um, went into the original design of the city, and uh, it echoes today and, and uh, you know, hundreds of years later is still quite useful. 
Um, just some views around the neighborhood where I stayed to give you an idea of the architecture there. Um, I talked a little bit about comparisons with Charleston. One thing that I found um, kind of nice about Savannah um, as opposed to Charleston is Charleston, um, if, if you've seen my Charleston program, you know I talk a lot about the historic district there, which was uh, pretty much the first in the United States. Um, and the, the thing that you see in Charleston is that the downtown historic area where most of the tourist activities are, where as a tourist you would be most likely to stay and spend your time, is incredibly beautiful. It's, it's picture perfect. There's not a tree out of place. Every house looks like it was painted yesterday. Um, Savannah is a little bit different, and I kind of like that. Um, it felt much more mixed architecturally, economically, racially, um, and um, felt a little less, um, I don't want to use the word Disney-esque because that's not really fair to Charleston. Charleston's an absolutely gorgeous city um, and well worth visiting, but Charleston really felt a little too perfect in some ways. And Savannah, I really got the impression that it was, um, I, I felt more like I was in a living, breathing city rather than a museum of architecture. Um, but uh, I, I think it's probably worth it to visit both of them and draw those comparisons yourself because they do have similar histories um, and similar lifestyles and similar um, architectural styles and so forth. Many of the homes in Savannah obviously are um, in the mid to late 19th century just because of the, um, the history of the city. The neighborhood that I stayed in was is particularly known for its big Victorian piles, you can see. Here's a good example of one on the right um, and another one here. They're just, um, if, if you like um, historic American architecture, it's uh, a beautiful place to stroll around because literally block after block after block has uh, the most fantastic houses, many of which have been turned into um, Airbnbs or bed and breakfasts and so forth. And there's a variety of different architectural styles um, because throughout the 19th century, when so many different um, uh, historical um, revival styles were happening in the United States, um, that's when most of the development was happening in Savannah. So you'll see a lot of uh, almost like, a, like I said, a museum of um, Greek revival and um, Italianate and Second Empire and Queen Anne and just uh, all, all the way down the streets, you can see all different kinds of architecture. It's a very walkable city also, um, even though I was um, at the other end of the, um, the downtown area, it was barely a 20 minute walk um, to the downtown historic district and a very pleasant walk. Savannah is very flat. Um, so um, it's a nice, easy place to stroll around. The traffic is minimal um, and um, it is the South. So believe it or not, unlike here in Boston, if you're trying to cross the street, people will actually stop and let you cross, which is something as a Bostonian, I was kind of had a hard time getting used to. Um, but it's, it really is a very delightful place to just stroll. Um, not too far from the place where I stayed is this adorable, 1896 um, gingerbread cottage, um, which uh, is on the east side of the, the city. Um, and it's now a museum. It was originally owned by uh, African Americans, Eugene and Sarah King. And it has been turned into a museum that focuses on uh, the history and the contributions of African Americans to the city. Um, this is not a famous house at all, but I loved it because it was looked like it was about to fall over. I would be very nervous to be living in this house. Um, the whole center of the city um, focuses on a, a large central park, 30 acres or so called Forsyth Park, which was created in the uh, 1840s and um, is named for Governor John Forsyth, who also served as the Secretary of State under President Andrew Jackson. And in fact, uh, Forsyth himself owned a significant amount of the land in this area and two thirds of what the park, um, what is now comprised of was land donated by Forsyth himself. It is now um, 
sort of the the big green along of the city um, and there's a big weekly farmers market and there are paths and benches to hang out lots of people go to just play music and sit in the sun um, there are ball fields and um, walking and bike paths there are open lawns for concerts and so forth um, playgrounds um, and in the center is what is arguably the most um, visible um, and well-known um, icon of the city, which is the 1858 fountain. Um, and it holds pride of place right in the center of the park where all of the paths converge. You can see because it was December, they had um, decorated a little bit for Christmas. So there were a lot of um, garlands and things on, on houses throughout the city and in the parks as well. Every year though, um, they turn the fountain green for St. Patrick's Day, because believe it or not, um, Savannah, Georgia has the largest Irish population in the country after Boston and New York. Um, so they do a big St. Patrick's Day uh, celebration, uh, which will be coming up very soon, actually, in the next month or so. Um, the park, of course, is also full of magnolia trees um, and uh, huge live oaks um, all over the place with Spanish moss hanging. You can see that here. Um, live oaks are so-called because um, unlike oak trees up uh, in this part of the country, uh, live oaks are not deciduous, they are evergreen, so they don't shed their leaves um, seasonally the way ours do. Um, and also interestingly, Spanish moss, which you can see hanging out all, all over the branches, is neither a moss nor is it Spanish. Um, it's what's called an epiphyte, which is a kind of um, plant that um, it's not a parasite, actually. It, it looks like it might harm the trees, um, but it doesn't actually do that um, unless there's so much of it that it impedes the sunlight. But um, as an epiphyte, what it is is basically just a plant that lives off of moisture from the air. So um, it drapes over the branches and from the humid, moist air and from rain, of course, as well, um, that's where it gets its nutrients. And it makes, of course, for a very atmospheric and very typical Southern look. Um, and in the park, it's also very nice because when the weather is extremely hot, which it wasn't in December, but it will be in the summer, um, it's a good place to get away from the heat and the humidity. Um, I did just notice in the chat, um, there's a question about needing a car. Um, and that kind of depends on what you're doing. Um, I did not have a car. Um, you could certainly rent a car in Charles uh, in Savannah, um, and the parking is um, compared to Boston. Driving and parking in Savannah is actually um, very easy. <laughs> um, however, I don't think you really need a car unless you were planning to do a lot of trips outside of the center of the city. Um, if you enjoy walking, um, I don't think you'd have any trouble. Um, and it certainly isn't necessary. There's also a really nice um, uh, public transit system. There are uh, buses and trams throughout the city. And for tourists, there is actually a completely free bus, uh, uh, like a trolley system that makes a big rectangular loop um, around uh, the downtown area and to the other end of uh, Forsyth Park. Um, so you might have to wait 15, 20 minutes for that to go by. But um, I think you, if, if you planned to pretty much stay in the downtown area, um, I think you could easily um, live without a car. I did take a couple of trips um, just outside the city. And for that, I used Uber because um, it was, uh, unless you're doing a lot of that, I don't think it's really necessary to have a car. Um, if, however, you're planning to do things like go to the beaches and Tybee Island, go to Hilton Head, um, and stay there longer exploring the general area, then a car would absolutely be worth it. Um, here was a um, LGBTQ um, softball game going on while I was in the park. Surrounding the park, um, this big Forsyth Park is um, on pretty much all four sides of the park. It's a big long rectangle. There are streets with um, beautiful, elegant homes from different periods. Here's a couple of examples of some of the earlier ones. Um, and this whole area is a historic district. 
Um, and it is uh, like the one in Charleston, it is one of the earliest um, historic districts uh, in the country. And they've done an excellent job uh, over the years preserving homes that would otherwise have disappeared to development. And now they, um, it, it was obviously a very good decision because Savannah makes most of its tourist money out of the fact that it is a gorgeous, gorgeous, uh, well-preserved historic American city. This is looking uh, up towards the fountain in the park. There are a couple of monuments. Um, this one, uh, this is a huge one to um, the Confederate dead. Um, it is the South after all, so you will see plenty of Confederate monuments. Um, Jess mentioned program, uh, an upcoming program at the Chelmsford Library that um, I'm sure will touch on a lot of these issues that have become more, um, more in the forefront um, in the past couple of years as people grapple with what it means to be uh, celebrating uh, the Confederacy. Um, it's, uh, we have a very different perspective up here than you would if you grew up with it down in, in a place like Savannah. But Savannah certainly as um, uh, compared to much of rural Georgia is very cosmopolitan. It's certainly um, on the more liberal side um, than you will find in other parts of uh, small town Georgia. I had to show this other um, uh, particular monument. This won't mean as much to those of you who are um, in Chelmsford or Tewksbury, but I needed to show it to the people uh, in my hometown of Wakefield here because the, mon the monument that you see on the left is an exact copy of the one that is well known here in downtown Wakefield. Um, the Hiker Monument, which is by a, a woman sculptor actually named Theo Kitson, um, an un, uh, unusual in her time period, which was 1906. This sculpture, um, there are a number of them around the country. We have one here in Wakefield. There's um, a few others around uh, different towns in Massachusetts and it commemorates the Spanish-American War. Um, but I did not expect to find that just wandering around a few blocks from the place that I stayed in Savannah. Um, heading back uh, north towards the river into the, the real downtown district, uh, this is the Cathedral Basilica of St. John um, the Baptist, um, and is certainly the most impressive of the many churches in the city. Uh, the congregation itself dates to the 1700s, but the building that you see here is from the late 1870s, and the spires, in fact, were not added until uh, a couple of decades later. Uh, the interior is absolutely gorgeous. There was a fire in 1898 that forced a complete renovation of the interior, so much of what you see now is um, a restored Gothic revival uh, version from about uh, the turn of the last century. Beautiful church. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat, someone else also asked um, if when I refer to the downtown and the historic district, um, are those the same thing? Essentially, yes. Um, the main historic district is the area um, where all of those squares are really close to the river, uh, the further north you get. However, um, there are a number of designated historic districts um, further south as you move through the more um, residential neighborhoods away from the downtown um, that are official historic districts as well. Um, but usually when I'm talking about the historic district in downtown, I'm talking about the area um, actually that starts right about where we are now in this photograph, north of Forsyth Park as you head up towards the Savannah River. This enormous house, which would be um, very comfortable in Newport, Rhode Island, um, is a Renaissance Revival mansion at the very north end of the park. And it was built in the 1930s um, as a private home. <laughs> and um, it, for a while, I think it was a junior college. It, it went through a couple of other um, periods in its life. Um, and it was almost demolished, um, but was then bought by uh, by a gentleman named Jim Williams, who we're going to talk about shortly. Um, and if you haven't, if you don't remember who he is, you will as soon as I explain his story. Um, and he later sold it to a law firm, which um, uses it today. But it's it's absolutely huge. It has 26,000 square feet. 
um, and 10 bedrooms. It must make a very nice office. So Jim Williams, I have to talk about him. Um, you can't really escape um, the story of the midnight of the Garden of Good and Evil um, when you travel around Savannah. And in fact, this book was a major factor in propelling Savannah to the forefront of American tourism a couple of decades ago. Um, the house that you see on the right is called Mercer Williams House. It's a very, um, a very good example of Italianate architecture. Um, and um, it was the site in 1981 of uh, the shooting of a young man named Denny Hansford, um, who was shot in this room here, the one just to the left of the front door, um, by the owner of the house, whose name was Jim Williams. He was a high profile antiques and art dealer. Um, and um, Danny was a hustler. They had a relationship of sorts. Um, and I shouldn't spoil all the details because it's really well worth reading the book. It's a great read. Um, and it was a huge bestseller um, in 1994 when the book came out and really put Savannah on the map. Um, the book is mostly about the murder um, and the subsequent um, trials. Um, but it also goes into a lot about the history of uh, the social history of Savannah, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And there are some really uh, wonderful, colorful characters um, that John Barron really um, brings to life in the book. So if you haven't read it, um, I, I would definitely go back and read it, even though this is it covers events that happened, um, uh, what, 30 years ago now? Oh God, 40 years ago, isn't that awful? Um, it's, it's still well worth reading. I, I read it when it first came out and I read it again last month. Um, and it was a lot of fun to actually read it in the city itself because um, the, the places meant so much more when I could walk around and see them. Um, Clint Eastwood made a movie about, uh, about it about three years after the book came out, three or four years. Um, which is, uh, it's okay, um, read the book. Um, but uh, it's a fantastic story. And when you go there, you can actually tour the house. It faces one of the many squares, it's called Monterey Square. Um, Williams um, was subsequent, he went through, I think it was three or possibly four trials related to the shooting and was ultimately acquitted after years and years and years of this. Um, and he, in 1990, ended up dying of a heart attack, um, dropped dead in the house. Um, and the house is now owned by his sister um, and is open for tours. And you can um, see all of the, the places and the furnishings and, and so forth. It's an absolutely gorgeous house inside. Um, and an, again, as I said, it's an excellent example of um, the uh, Italianate style, which was kind of 1850s to 1880s, um, and it's characterized by um, the kind of pediments and heavy ornamented brackets like you see here. Um, here again is the, the famous fateful room. This was uh, William's office where the shooting took place. Um, interestingly, if you do watch the movie, um, there are some fairly significant differences between the book and the film, although I think he, he did a pretty good job of it. But um, it's a little funny to watch the film now because um, Jim Williams is played by none other than Kevin Spacey. And um, of course, when the movie came out, we didn't know a lot about Kevin Spacey that we do now. So it put kind of a different cast on the film to watch it um, more recently. He actually is probably very well cast um, playing, uh, playing Jim Williams. The, the movie was also partially filmed in the house um, and around Charleston. So you will see a lot of interiors that were, are actually of the inside of the property. And uh, this is a very good example of what one of these squares looks like. Again, this is Monterey Square. Um, most of the squares 
are beautifully landscaped, um, very green, very shady, with um, large old trees and surrounded by beautiful, beautiful homes. Um, this is the back of the house. And uh, with balconies facing out onto the garden. Um, just across the street is um, another very beautiful home, still a private home that um, was owned by one of uh, William's arch enemies um, in, in both the book and the film. Um, he and his neighbor were on opposite sides of a lot of social and political um, activities going on in the city. Um, that is still a private home, it cannot be visited. Um, another one of the big places that's uh, well worth visiting is a house called the Green Meldrum House, um, which is a Gothic revival house, very different style, on Madison Square, a few blocks away. And it's uh, adjacent to the St. John's Episcopal Church, which is uh, kind of where this photograph is taken from. It was built in 1853, much more massive than a typical Gothic revival house would be. Um, but um, it's absolutely gorgeous. It has these beautiful cast iron fences and balconies um, and uh, a fairly large garden for a downtown mansion in Savannah. This house was used by uh, General Sherman during the Civil War. Um, and in fact, uh, if you remember your American history, you might remember that Sherman wrote a famous telegram um, to President Lincoln offering Savannah as a Christmas gift that he had taken the city. And that telegram was composed um, in this house, which he was um, occupying at the time. Um, you can see these beautiful Oriel windows on the second floor. And again, some beautiful balconies looking out over the gardens. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to take photographs inside either of these houses, which is a shame because the interiors are beautiful. I did want to snag a couple of photos from the Library of Congress just to show you um, how incredibly ornate uh, the Green Meldrum House is inside. Um, you can see the, these are the, uh, you can see this, the, the main stairway and um, the main salon and drawing room. The incredibly elaborate Gothic revival um, plaster work is just um, beyond anything I've seen in any other house. Um, the house really, at this point, most of the furnishings that are in the house are not original, um, although um, they have tried to fill it with um, pieces that are at the very least uh, appropriate to the time period and to the family that lived there. Here's another one just across the street. Um, Greek Revival House. I didn't have time um, to visit this. Um, many of these houses, including this one, um, are considered haunted for one reason or another. So if you're into that sort of thing, Savannah, like Charleston, like New Orleans, um, has a lot of haunted tours, um, uh, which often go around at night where you can visit various supposedly haunted locations. Um, and those are a lot of fun if you enjoy that kind of thing. and just some more scenes um, around the historic downtown with very typical um, Southern style uh, row houses. Um, here's another of the main churches in town. This is the Independent Presbyterian Church, which has a stunning spire. Um, another one of the main um, mansions that you can visit is the Owens Thomas House. This one's a little, um, a little more interesting because uh, it's more of a museum of history rather than just uh, a fancy house. Um, it includes uh, very well preserved slave quarters behind the property um, and it sits on Oglethorpe Square. You'll remember Oglethorpe is the original founder of the city. Um, this is an earlier house built in 1819 and is one of the best examples of English Regency architecture anywhere in the country. Um, in fact, it was designed by an architect from Bath, England, um, which is where um, 
a lot of English Regency style uh, architecture is can be found. And you can see here's a close up of the balcony on the side in cast iron. Um, the Marquis de Lafayette um, was in Savannah at one point for a speech um, when he visited there in 1825, and he made the speech from this very balcony. Um, but it's a beautiful interior, very uh, extremely elegant, very detailed and typical of the English Regency, which makes use of um, a lot of very, um, very delicate um, classical motifs. So you can see the columns, um, tile work, and also uh, a lot of very detailed plaster work is very common in the Regency style. Um, something that I had never seen before was this very unusual um, in one of the salons of the house. This is actually um, natural light. There, the, this is an exterior wall, and there is actually a little bay that um, bows out into the uh, over the sidewalk that has a little skylight built into it that allows this uh, golden light to come in. And here's the upstairs which has an unusual arched bridge. You can see the sort of this, this almost like a, a, a garden style bridge um, over the main stairwell. And it also has beautiful gardens um, and terraces. And across um, the garden, if you're looking from the back of the house, there are very, uh, very nicely preserved and turned into a museum, slave quarters. Um, I should mention that um, obviously um, anywhere that you travel in the South, you're going to see a lot of the history of slavery in the United States. And it was, um, I've noticed over the past few years, um, there's been a distinct change in a lot of these um, historic properties and museums in how they present um, the history of slavery in the country. It must, it, it's very difficult, as you can imagine, because um, it's a difficult part of our history and it's hard to, um, it's hard to capitalize on it as a historical, um, uh, for historical education purposes without, um, and to do it justice. Um, there's a big difference between this kind of museum and the kind where you might um, go to, uh, I've been to Southern plantations where um, there are teenage girls walking around the property in hoop skirts. Um, and that kind of thing seems to be going away. And in fact, one of the things that I've noticed in some of the places I've visited is the very conscious effort to change the vocabulary. And you will notice that um, most of the time, um, these museums will now no longer re refer to slaves, but rather to enslaved people or enslaved workers. And that's a very deliberate um, effort on their part um, to get away from the idea that a person's identity was based on being a slave. These were not people who were born as slaves. They were human beings who were enslaved by someone else. Um, it was an aspect of their life, but not their identity. And so it's a subtle difference, but it's noticeable that almost every museum that I, or historic home that I've visited that deals with the topic has made the switch in an effort to um, kind of change people's perspectives about how we think about slavery. Um, and of course, even in uh, the cities, Charleston, New Orleans, um, Savannah, um, plenty of people had, um, had enslaved workers in the homes. It didn't necessarily happen um, just on large rural plantations where there were crops and agriculture, um, servants worked in the house, um, lived in the house, um, took care of the family, took care of the cooking, took care of the property. Um, so it was just as likely for people living in the downtown area with a, a relatively small parcel of land to own uh, a number of enslaved people that, that um, that work for the family. Um, in this particular property, they, they highlight what's called haint blue, um, which is a particular light colored blue that's very popular in the South 
and and even up here north, my own porch here at my house um, has uh, is is painted light blue. And originally in the south, it was uh, considered uh, a way of protecting against evil spirits. Um, but it's a very common design feature that you'll see today. Um, this is the back of the house looking from the slave quarters back up to the main property. Around the corner is another um, property that's um, kind of cool. This is a big second empire building, excuse me, called the Hamilton Turner. Inn. And it was owned at one point. Uh, again, if you've, if you've read Midnight in the Garden, um, there's a, a very colorful character named Joe Odom. Um, and uh, he's he's a con artist and he's has wild parties and um, he, he's colorful, let's put it that way. This is one of the places that uh, he owned uh, back uh, in the 80s when, um, when all those events were going on. Uh, it was the first house in Savannah uh, to have electricity in it. Um, and miraculously, this whole neighborhood of Savannah had a huge fire in 1898. Um, and miraculously, this building survived that fire. So it's one of the few um, buildings in that neighborhood that's of that era. Now it's a hotel, uh, a very chic boutique hotel. And you can stay there starting at about $300 a night. Um, just again, some more views around the city stately southern mansions on every corner, um, but also a few surprises. Uh, this is the congregation Yitve Israel um, across, right across the square from the Mercer Williams house. Um, and uh, it is one of the oldest synagogues in the United States and very unusual in that it's got a Gothic revival style, which was much more typical of Christian churches. Um, this particular building, um, like many of the religious big buildings in Savannah, this uh, the congregation actually started much earlier. Many, um, many churches um, and other buildings uh, were destroyed by fire at some point. And this is a later incarnation built in the 1870s. Um, more typical streets and typical squares. Almost every one of the squares that you'll visit has some focal point in the middle, like a fountain, or a memorial, a sculpture, something. Um, here's another great Second Empire house. And one of the boulevards. Um, there are a number of streets um, in the, the downtown area that are kind of similar to Mass Ave here in Boston. Um, in other words, they have, um, they're very, very wide and are separated, divided down the middle with elegant landscaped mall um, with trees and uh, pedestrian pathways and monuments and so forth. Um, as we move towards the river, you'll start to see more commercial buildings. Um, this one actually used to be a Masonic Lodge and um, larger government buildings as well. This um, Renaissance Revival building used to be the post office. Um, and also it was shared between the post office and the federal courthouse. Um, it's built entirely of marble from Georgia, the state of Georgia, and it fills an entire city block um, and is now the US District Court. Um, but there's some really nice details on a lot of the old buildings downtown. Uh, this is another uh, house museum that, that is open for tours. I didn't happen to go inside this one. This is called the Harper Folks House, um, and uh, it was built in 1842, all decked out for Christmas. Um, another interesting building, uh, there's, there's a good, um, in addition to all of the house museums, there's some very good art museums uh, in Savannah, most of which are connected with the Telfair Academy. Um, and this was built in 1818 um, by an architect named William Jay, who was the same architect who did the Owens Thomas House. Um, that's the one that had the, um, the slave quarters attached to it. And it is one of the oldest art museums in the United States. And it has an excellent collection of paintings, decorative arts, furnishings, so forth. 
Um, in fact, they own, they own the Owens Thomas House as well, the same organization. Um, this is the original building um, built uh, in 1818, as I said, but their collection expanded so much that they, um, about a block away, they built a huge addition uh, or a huge new building, a uh, very modern building um, by the well-known architect Moshe Safdi. Um, and that uh, includes a, a huge portion of their collection, but it's still right downtown. The commercial district, as we get very close to the river now, uh, the commercial district centers on Broughton Street, which has endless shops and restaurants and um, bars and clubs that stay open till all hours, um, as well as plenty of hotels. Um, and a nice collection of very well maintained and restored, uh, mostly 19th century commercial buildings. Um, parallel to Broughton Street is Congress Street, which is one block north, and that's where most of the downtown commerce is located. Um, at the very far west end, if you go all the way on, uh, on Broughton, uh, actually no, Congress, I take it back, not that it matters, uh, you'll find uh, an area called City Market, which is very similar to uh, Quincy Market here in Boston. Um, it's been pedestrianized, uh, it's kind of touristy, um, but on the other hand, it's a lot of fun, it's always full of people, um, and there's a huge concentration of places to eat and shop and hang out. And uh, it's just, uh, uh, it's a nice place to, to spend a little time. Um, and right at the entrance to this uh, area is the famous statue of Johnny Mercer. Um, he is one of America's probably most famous lyricists. He did compose music as well, but he's probably better known um, for his lyrics. He wrote um, Moon River, Hooray for Hollywood, Days of Wine and Roses, um, and countless others that I'm sure you would recognize. Um, he uh, ended up winning four Oscars uh, for best song at various points in his career. And he was born right here in Savannah in 1909. Um, his, um, his birthplace was not too far from the, uh, the bed and breakfast that I stayed in. Um, in this part of town, you can have other kinds of Southern experiences like the beef jerky experience. Or if you want something a little bit more upscale, you could have the go to the better than sex dessert restaurant. Um, but to be a bit more historic, right around the corner um, in Franklin Square is the first African Baptist church, which claims to be the first um, Baptist, uh, African American Baptist church in the country and it dates to the late 1700s. Um, again, there were previous buildings that uh, were damaged in fires and so forth. So the building that you see in this photo is from 1859. And in addition to being a, uh, still being an active parish, uh, an active uh, congregation rather, it is now a museum as well um, that you can visit. And in the center, just opposite it on the right, you can see a monument. Um, this is the Haitian monument. Um, to the all-Black Haitian regiment um, that fought in the American Revolution. An interesting facade. And uh, one of the old uh, 1921 uh, theaters um, that is still showing films. Um, I never found out what this building originally was. Now I think it's just offices, but I noticed that it has um, prominent beehives on the, on the moldings. I'm not sure what those refer to. Um, here's some more pictures of uh, the downtown area. And I did wanna highlight one particular building. This is also on Broughton Street. This is called the Marshall House. Um, and it has um, New Orleans style balconies, the typical cast iron. Uh, and it was built in 1851 and like other buildings in Savannah was occupied by Sherman um, and his Union troops and used as a hospital. Um, because of that, it has a lot of stories attached to it. So it's another one of the popular stops on the haunted Savannah tours. Um, but if you go up to the third floor, um, there is, uh, in addition to rooms that you can stay in, there is a very nice museum of Savannah history. 
um, in addition to being a historic inn. The, um, I wouldn't say it's cheap, but it's not expensive. Rooms here start about 150 bucks a night. Um, and it's in an excellent location right downtown. Um, here is another um, downtown Mont Clary's Cafe and Diner is a local favorite. You can see all the people waiting outside um, to get in on a Sunday morning. Um, and it also figures prominently in both the book and the film of Midnight in the Garden. If you go all the way up, if you keep walking north um, past the um, the downtown uh, commercial district, you will eventually go as far as you can and you'll end up in the river. Um, and appropriately, this is River Street. Um, and there is a river walk where you can still see the old uh, train tracks that were used um, to move goods that were coming uh, from ships along the river. As you head up that way, at the north end of Bull Street, which is the pretty much the main uh, central north-south axis, um, it follows all the way from the south side of the city up uh, to Forsyth Park and continues on the opposite side of the park all the way up to the river, you will eventually get to City Hall, uh, which was built in 1905, and the dome is visible from blocks and blocks away. Interestingly, this beautiful gold dome um, was not gilt until 1987, um, which may explain why it still looks so nice. But this is also a very nice area to stroll around, uh, not uh, maybe a block away or so is the old Savannah Cotton Exchange, um, built in 1876, which for a while was used as another Masonic lodge. Um, the whole city is built on a bluff um, fairly high up over the river. You don't really feel that when you're walking around the city, but as you get to the river, you realize you have to actually walk down quite a ways to get to uh, the waterfront. And you can see here there are uh, the road slopes down um, below the the commercial street level and many of the buildings um, that are in that next block have these little um, bridges, the uh, iron bridges that um, lead from one side to the other over um, the road that uh, would have been used to bring goods up to the level of the city. Um, here's a, an even better example. You can see the, the old cobblestone road um, goes from the main level of the city all the way down. Um, and it's probably a good 20, 30 feet when you get down to, to river level, where the original docks and warehouses would have been. Um, this is the World War II monument. And it really is a great place to um, stroll up and down the riverfront. Um, if you look up the river, um, you'll see the Talmadge Bridge, which was built in 1991 uh, to replace an earlier bridge. Talmadge was a governor, by the way, that's why it's named after him. Um, and it is, as you can see, it's quite a high bridge, high enough to accommodate um, some of the huge container ships um, that need to fit underneath to get up to the, uh, the docks where you, you can see the cranes way off in, in the distance up the river. And there's plenty of opportunities to take river cruises on new boats and old boats or new boats pretending to be old boats like this one. Um, and even if you don't, um, just strolling the river is a really nice place to go. They've really done uh, wonderful things with their waterfront. There's a lot of shops and restaurants um, and uh, historic markers all the way along. Um, that explain the history of the port. And if you're lucky, you will get to see a container ship go by. Um, Savannah is now the fourth largest container port in the United States. It moves more than four and a half million of these containers, um, these shipping containers every year. And it is not unusual to see them uh, going by the city. They're unbelievably huge. <laughs> in fact, um, even if you understand all the, the physics of water displacement and so forth, it, 
it's hard to imagine that they don't just sink like a stone to the bottom of the river, um, let alone how they don't tip over. Um, I'm sure uh, we've all seen these containers close up um, at some point. And when you see um, 15 or 20 of them wide, and uh, six or seven of them high, you can imagine just how huge these ships are. Um, the land that you can kind of see uh, just on the opposite side of the river, although Savannah's on the border with South Carolina, that land is actually not South Carolina. It is an island called Hutchinson Island that is still in Georgia. And the river, uh, the Savannah River actually goes on the other side of that island. Um, there's a little stretch called the Little Back River, which is where the actual border with South Carolina is. So on the island in between, there's a golf club and also the convention center. Um, which uh, is a good spot to look back over at the city um, and see the historic uh, skyline of Savannah across the river. So this is what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 11, 12, that's nine, 19 containers and wide and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and eight high, unbelievable. Um, Sticking around this general area of town up by the river, this is another square called Reynolds Square. Um, and the building we're looking at is called the Old Pink House from 1771. It was originally the home of a wealthy plantation owner um, who was involved in the American Revolution. Now it's a very swanky restaurant, um, but it's a beautiful spot looking out over the square. Here's another one of the beautiful boulevards. And um, there's a cemetery up here that's worth visiting. We're gonna visit the more famous cemetery in just a moment, um, but it's worth it to stop in Colonial Park Cemetery, even though it doesn't have really the same Victorian atmosphere um, as Bonaventure does, uh, which we'll see shortly. Uh, but it's a much older cemetery. They stopped burials about the time, uh, like around 1850 or so, which is about the time that Bonaventure Cemetery started burials. Um, during the Civil War, um, this cemetery, which covers, oh, maybe say the space of about four city blocks in the center of town, um, because it's so close to downtown, it was used as an encampment by Union soldiers. Um, and it still has its own unique beauty. Um, and it's a very peaceful spot right in the middle of, middle of the city. Here's some more row houses good examples of uh, the kind of typical houses you'll see in this part of town. And I need to point out um, the, the brick, which you might notice is a kind of unusual gray, grayish color. Um, and it's known as Savannah gray brick. These were often made by um, slaves in the early 1800s. Um, and they have this particular muted color that is unique to the city based on the way they were made and the uh, the clay that was used in their manufacture. And you'll see that in a lot of the houses around, uh, around the city in contrast to this kind of color, which is the, the brick that we're uh, much more used to seeing up north um, here, say on Beacon Hill, for example. But there are beautiful row houses um, all throughout the city. And uh, if you remember back to the beginning when I mentioned those back alleys, you can see this is a good example of a street where um, there are no trash bins, there are no garages, there are no little driveways um, in between the houses. All of that is hidden behind uh, because every single block um, has one of those alleys. Um, here's a slightly more Victorian neighborhood. There were a number of fires at different points of Savannah's history. So many of the earliest wooden homes um, were destroyed um, in those fires. And so most of the buildings that you see that are made of wood are from the later 19th century. And, and as a result, they are mostly Victorian in style. Um, back again to, the, um, to Forsyth Park, you can see the Georgia Historic Society, which has a very nice museum in it, um, right at the Northwest end of Forsyth Park. And uh, this was never a mansion. Um, it was specifically built in the 1870s as a library, museum, historic society. That was its original purpose. And just a few more scenes around the city before we 
um, head out to the cemetery. Um, I had to uh, I had to take this picture just because I, I thought it was interesting. If, if you followed any of the the politics around um, COVID, you'll know that Georgia has been um, on definitely on the conservative side, um, and um, they have um, a law that specifically um, exempts businesses from any liability related to COVID. So most of the businesses in in um, the downtown area had these pre-printed signs that say, you can wear a mask, you can not wear a mask, but whatever happens, it's your problem. <laughs> it's, um, it, it was definitely a, a, a different, uh, different from Massachusetts, let's put it that way. Um, here's another beautiful house. Um, this is one of the more famous Victorian houses in the city from 1899. Um, and it's in what's called Steamboat Gothic, which is a very Southern style with all this overwrought um, gingerbread kind of stuff that you can imagine on the old um, uh, riverboat. Um, it's now open for events. You can get married there. This is the side view of the house. And it's right across the street from the public library, which of course I had to visit as a librarian. Um, this is one of the public library branches, uh, the one on Bull Street. Beautiful building that has a very nice big addition and a gorgeous interior. And I loved the, uh, the quote over the door that says, this eternal court is open to you with its society wide as the world, the chosen and the mighty of every place and time. And just some more details that you can see strolling around. The one on the, uh, the house on the right here was the childhood um, home of uh, the well-known Southern Gothic writer, Flannery O'Connor. Um, and I would highly recommend um, eating in Mrs. Wilkes's dining room, which is one of the um, traditional places for, for people to eat, but the food is really good. Um, it's one of the more famous restaurants in the city. It's not fancy. Um, but it's good, uh, good old fashioned Southern cooking. And it was funny, you, um, they don't take reservations. You just show up, wait in line. And I happened to get there on a day when um, they, were, they were just closing at two o'clock. And I had asked, oh, maybe I should come back um, tomorrow. And uh, the hostess said, oh, definitely don't because the line will be out the door by 10 o'clock in the morning. So um, we're still serving, no problem. So I got takeout food. Um, and sat out on the, on the sidewalk, but they had all of this food because they were closing at two o'clock. They had all this food that they were going to have to throw out. So I end up, ended up getting about three times as much food as I actually ordered. <laughs> and I ate it for probably three days running, um, but it was delicious. Um, some more elegant row houses along the squares. And many of them are, uh, because I was there in December, many, many of the houses were decorated for the holidays with Christmas decorations inside and out. It's a little funny, of course, um, to be somewhere that never gets any snow, um, seeing everything um, decorated with, with ribbons and so forth, but it, it was a very festive atmosphere. and some more Victorian streetscape stuff. Um, I'm gonna quickly show you one more historic home before we go out to the outskirts of the city. Um, this one I think is worth visiting because it's a little bit different from the others. It's called Davenport House. Um, and it was built in 1820 in brick. This is another one of the homes that was built right after a, a major fire that destroyed much of this part of the city. Um, a lot of the wooden structures disappeared. Um, and it's interesting as a museum because it's one of the few that they um, were fortunate to have a complete inventory of everything that was in the house at the time that the owner died. Um, and that was uh, very important for historians to see um, the, the kinds of belongings that would have been in a house, what their value was, every single thing, the clothing, the furnishings, the, uh, the kitchen implements, um, it's incredibly detailed. 
And so as a result, they've been able to piece together the life um, that went on in that house and the history of the family and so forth. The, the owner was Isaiah Davenport, and he wasn't actually, it, he wasn't poor, but he wasn't wealthy. Let's, let's say he was, not, he was not at the highest elite level of wealth in the city, um, but he was a carpenter by trade. And he built this house after the fire when he knew that there was going to be a lot of building going on in the city to replace uh, the buildings that had been lost or damaged. Um, he built this as essentially as a show house um, to show off his skills as a carpenter and a builder. So all of the details of the house are, are just unbelievable. The beautiful stairway, um, there are all kinds of different moldings throughout the house. Um, you can see plaster work, all of which uh, the uh, the moldings uh, over the, the front entrance, the windows, um, even the wallpaper. All of this was specifically designed to show off to potential clients what he was capable of doing. And it did get him a lot of work. There are a number of buildings throughout Savannah that um, were built by him in the subsequent years. Um, I will point out one thing that you might not notice at first. If you look at the floor, um, which at first looks like just a very nice wood floor. Um, but if you, if you look carefully, you'll notice there are no actual um, seams in this floor. Um, there are also no knots, even though this is pine, this is Southern pine, um, but he specifically built this floor to demonstrate that he could build floors that had absolutely no seams. So all of the, all of the planks run the entire length of the room um, with no seams and no knots. And this obviously would um, be a much more elegant floor um, than one um, that's uh, a more typical pine floor like you'd see in a, um, in a lot of the houses that we have around here. Um, just down the street is one of the few examples of early wooden houses that managed to survive the fire. Um, it's uh, a very humble house that would not have been for anyone wealthy. This would have been for um, the, the lower economic classes. Um, and not too far away is the Unitarian Church. This has an interesting story. Um, this is on Oglethorpe Square, um, and it's the Unitarian Church, Unitarian Universalist, and it was dedicated in 1851. It's important because it's connected to the song Jingle Bells. Um, and if you are from Massachusetts, you may know that we also have a connection to Jingle Bells. And there's even a controversy over the origins of the song. Um, it was written by a guy named James, uh, James Pierpont, who was born in Boston, um, but he was a Confederate soldier. And he wrote this song that was originally called The One Horse Open Sleigh. And it actually, it was a winter song. It had nothing to do with Christmas. Um, but there is now uh, a minor controversy over who gets to lay claim to this song. Um, the city of Medford here, just outside of Boston, um, claims that he wrote the song there in 1850, um, but it didn't actually get copyrighted and published um, until 1857 in Boston, but then it wasn't actually performed anywhere publicly until um, a few years later in Savannah here in this church. So there's a lot of, it's that whole, you know, uh, it, it reminds me of the controversy between Marblehead and Beverly as to who is the birthplace of the American Navy. Um, it probably doesn't matter, but um, if you go down there, you will see um, an interesting uh, historic marker in the middle of the uh, Oglethorpe Square that talks all about this. Um, but I wanna take you to two interesting places just outside the city. Um, because I think it's well worth it to get a little bit away. They're too far to walk. Um, you can, um, I took an Uber um, because I wasn't really planning to do a lot of driving. It's, it's not far. Um, so you could certainly take an Uber or a cab or something like that. Um, or, or if you have your own car, they're probably 15, 20 minutes out of town. Bonaventure Cemetery is probably the most famous attraction in all of Savannah. Um, it's 160 acres, um, and it's on a bluff overlooking uh, the river outside of the city, um, kind of to the southeast of the city. 
um, and it's on the site of a, uh, uh, a former plantation, which no longer exists. And burials began there in the 1850s. Um, it's probably one of the most atmospheric cemeteries in all of America, um, partly because of the location and of course, because of the landscaping with the Spanish moss and the trees and the beautiful um, the Victorian monuments, very elaborate, um, along the lines of uh, cemeteries that you might have seen in Paris, for example, or Highgate Cemetery in London, places like that. Um, there are innumerable outfits that will do walking tours, uh, but you can also go on your own. You can get a map. Um, there's even a smartphone app that you can use that um, using GPS, you can wander around and see um, the important monuments some of which are important um, because of who's buried there and some of who some of which are important just because uh, the monument itself is so beautiful. Um, there are lots like this with um, uh, haunting sculptures. On the right is one of the more famous ones. Um, this is six-year-old Gracie Watson, who was uh, just a young girl, an only child who died in 1889 of pneumonia. Um, and so although she wasn't famous in and of herself, um, the, the unusual uh, uh, tombstone is what makes her famous now. Um, I do have to mention, of course, that the famous Bird Girl statue, which is, um, was made famous by being used for the cover of um, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, used to be in this cemetery, and a lot of people go there looking for it, and it is no longer there um, because the the popularity of the book and later the film drew so many people to the cemetery to see if they could find the statue that it was getting out of control. Um, the traffic was just just too much, so they uh, moved uh, the statue uh, to the Telfair Museum, uh, the Academy of Arts, um, which I mentioned is is down in the, the downtown district. Um, so you can see it there. It's only about four feet high. Um, but um, it made for a, a very striking and atmospheric, um, one of the most famous book covers in recent years. Um, but all through the cemetery, you can um, wander around. Um, I was there on a sunny day, and I have to say, I think it would almost be better on a day when it was more gray, it would be more um, atmospheric. There are a lot of famous people, mostly Savannah, famous people like uh, governors of Georgia and local luminaries and, and so forth. Um, but much of what makes it um, a fun place to visit, visit is just um, coming around a corner and seeing these extremely moving monuments. And if you walk all the way to the end, you will get to the place where you can uh, uh, get a beautiful view over the wetlands and the Wilmington River uh, that curves around uh, the bluff that uh, the cemetery is on. Um, the famous people who you might have heard of who are there, um, one of them is Conrad Aiken, who was a very famous poet and, and poet laureate, in fact. Um, had kind of a sad upbringing, um, but uh, he was born and died in Georgia. Um, and again, probably the most famous son of Savannah, you've already seen the Johnny Mercer statue back downtown, but here you can see his grave along with um, a number of his family members as well. Uh, and every one of them has one of his song lyrics included um, on the stones, which I think is, is kind of fun. And the angel, this is his, and the angels sing. Um, my mama told me. Um, the whole family is in a, a beautiful arrangement. Um, this is not a famous person. I just thought it was an, a very unusual tomb. These are uh, oak leaves made entirely out of bronze. I'm not sure what the the symbolism is supposed to be. And I'm gonna end the program by taking you to uh, another place 
just uh, maybe half an hour outside of the city um, called the Wormslow Historic Site, which is a few miles downtown, uh, downtown on the Skidaway River. Um, and it was originally a plantation house, um, actually a fortified plantation house, if you can believe it, not the typical one that you would um, imagine um, in, in your mind's eye, but a much more modest, small um, property with just a few rooms, but completely fortified because it was so early um, between um, native tribes and also pirates. Um, it was important to be protected when you were uh, way out in such an exposed location on the river. The house at this point is long gone, although you can still see the foundations um, and uh, the area around where the house originally was. But the site itself is, is what makes it fantastic. And um, you have to go, if only to just see this incredibly stunning uh, one and a half mile long alley of 400 live oak trees. Um, you can actually drive down it. I got dropped off at the entrance and, and walked. Um, and it, it was just beautiful to do that. I've, I've never seen anything like it. Um, if you get all the way down to the other end, there's a beautiful park um, as well as a museum and walking trails that take you through the forest. Um, so you have views of the wetlands and the, the marshes around the, uh, the river. On the property or right next to the property is a more recent plantation home from 1828 that you can kind of see if you look through the trees. Um, but, um, and that is still standing and uh, still lived in. It's privately owned and not open to the public, um, but it is connected to the same family um, that originally owned Wormslow. So when you get all the way down to the end, you can explore um, a, a nice sort of low country oak and pine forest um, on some very nice woodland paths. And eventually you'll get out uh, where you can uh, view the river and the marshes from, from up high. It's a very peaceful spot. And if you just want to get out of the city for a little bit, not, not that Savannah is a, a particularly overwhelming city, but if you wanna get out in nature, it's um, barely 20 minutes out of town. And you'll feel like you are um, miles and miles away. So I will end the program there and I am going to stop sharing my screen. And if anyone would like to go through the, looking through the chats just to see if there's any questions um, that anyone has that I missed. Um, someone says, I visited in 2002 and at that time there was a multi-story parking garage in one of the squares. Yes, um, if it's the one that I'm thinking of, yes, it was. Um, there's a couple of, well, now I'm trying to remember because there was more than one, um, there's more than one square that had that problem. And I'm pretty sure um, there's one place where there is an ugly parking garage that is still there but it's not actually on the square, it's just adjacent to it. Um, but there was another square way over towards City Market that I believe had something on it that was torn down. Um, and although the square, it hasn't been restored to be so beautiful that you know it, it's, it's not full of big old trees and, and that sort of thing, um, it at least has been turned back into an actual square. So I, I'd have to double check which one was which um, to be sure of that. Um, someone asked, how many days would you recommend for visiting Savannah? I was there for four days in total. Uh, and I found that more than adequate um, to see most of the stuff. And again, it kind of depends on what you want. Obviously, if you're interested in um, museums. I, I tended to, just because it was at the height of COVID and Omicron, I tended not to do too many indoor things. 
Um, if I were to go back at another time, I would plan on doing that. If you want to go to restaurants and bars and clubs, uh, you might want to spend more time. Um, I think three or four days is certainly enough to give you the, the sense of the city and to see um, a selection of the big sites. Pick one or two of the mansions if that's the sort of thing you like. Um, that would give you more than enough time to go shopping and certainly um, spend two or three hours uh, going out to see Bonaventure Cemetery. Um, the, where, where you could add on a number of extra days is if you wanted to rent a car and see a lot of stuff um, outside the city itself. Uh, Tybee Island, um, way out um, at the edge of the ocean. There's a lot of beautiful beaches. You could go up to Hilton Head. Um, so there's plenty of stuff to do in the area. Um, but if, if all you want to do is just go get a city break where you see some interesting historic stuff, um, I think you could easily do that in th three days, four days. Um, and there are, uh, there are plenty of uh, relatively inexpensive flights um, from Boston to, to Savannah. Um, I will mention also that I went to, um, two years ago, we went to Charleston. Um, so I, I was kind of glad to see both of them um, and uh, because there are a lot of similarities, but also some important differences um, to see them relatively close in time. I don't know that I would do both of them in the same trip because um, although they're very close to one another, I think you might end up just feeling like it was uh, too much of a good thing, too much historic architecture all at once, and it would all blend together. I think I, I enjoyed it better um, making a separate trip to each place to really feel like I was getting to know each one. Um, the Gordon Lowe House. Um, I did not go there. Um, I, I went by it, and yes, um, that is another one of the well-known properties that you can visit. Uh, Julia Gordon, Julia Gordon Lowe, Juliette Gordon Lowe is the um, founder of the Girl Scouts, um, and so her her house is one of the um, publicly open house museums that you can visit. Um, I did not go there, but um, and I I would say it's it's probably in like the top five or six historic houses to visit. So if you have some interest in Girl Scouting and, and in uh, her history, absolutely go there. Um, foods, lots of Southern food. Um, grits, things made out of cabbage. There's lots of fish, catfish. Um, picture pretty much any kind of typical Southern food. Um, and you can get it in Savannah. But Savannah is also a huge foodie city. So uh, uh, there's a Husk restaurant there if you want like really incredibly expensive um, farm to table kind of stuff. Um, there, there's all sorts um, that you can get there. Um, but all the kind of typical Southern food that you might find um, in Atlanta or New Orleans, all that kind of stuff. Um, best time of year to go there? Probably any time but the summer. <laughs> uh, if you can stand the humidity, um, then go ahead. But I, um, it's, it's almost any time of year is good to be there except the really hot summer months. And the fall is iffy because of hurricanes. Um, which, you know, you can't really predict, but um, uh, when you start to get into late August and September, the weather is nice, but you never know whether a hurricane could completely upend your, um, your plans. Um, um, and taking children there, um, I think it's, <sighs> I wasn't really traveling there with that in mind, um, but I think the kids would, there, there are a number of museums that the kids would like, um, depending on the ages and what their interests are. All of the haunted stuff, I think kids would probably enjoy. Um, there are um, plenty of trolley tours. Um, Bonaventure Cemetery, I think kids would probably 
enjoy it just for the atmosphere. Um, there are some specific things for children um, that I didn't really pay much attention to because, again, that's not what I was doing there. Um, but there are a number of really good travel guides to Savannah. Most of the major travel publishers like um, like Fodor's and Moon and, and other places have have good Savannah guides with excellent recommendations for kids. Um, it's an easy city to get around with kids because the walking isn't so bad and the bus and um, trolley tours are easy ways to get around if you're traveling with kids. Um, so I, I think it would be a great place to go for kids. And, and of course, um, if you're there for a few days, you can take them to the beach. <laughs> so any other questions? No, I think that's um, I think that's all the questions that I could see there, Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, I did uh, leave an opening for one more question if there's someone who desperately needs it answered. But I know that you also welcome questions to your email address, yeah. um, which um, I can share with um, people when I send out the recording for this presentation. Great. Um, I do know that my son is was about three years old when we stopped over for a little bit in Savannah. And we had a great time just walking along the harbor, going through the shops and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, so it was, it's, I think there's a lot you could do there. Um, yeah, everyone just says, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, okay. for another great presentation. Great, I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. Glad, glad to see everyone. And I hope to see you again I forget when our next one is, and I believe we're going to Thailand, right? Is the next one? Yep. Um, so we'll see you then. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night, everyone. <laughs>